In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis makes some statements regarding pride. I want to read a few of these statements to you, have you think about them. Then I'd like to discuss it to see if what he says is true. According to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil, is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Pride is the complete anti-God state of mind. Later he says, the Christians are right. It is pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. Other vices may sometimes bring people together. You may find good fellowship and jokes and friendliness among drunken people or unchaste people, but pride always means enmity. It is enmity, and not only enmity between man and man, but enmity to God. Later, it is a terrible thing that the worst of all the vices can smuggle itself into the very center of our religious life. But you can see why. The other and less bad vices come from the devil working on us through our animal nature. But this does not come through our animal nature at all. It comes directly from hell. It is purely spiritual. Consequently, it is far more subtle, far more deadly. And finally, for pride is spiritual cancer. It eats up the very possibility of love or contentment or even common sense. He is uh, pretty firm in his diagnosis and his analysis, isn't he, of this one of the seven deadly sins, pride. What many people do not seem to realize when they look at the Bible, although really we should, is that things that we find there, every sort of thing, every sort of event, tends to repeat itself in patterns. Every one of you have heard the expression, history repeats itself. Human conduct repeats itself. And the fact of the matter is that there are patterns. Where they come from and why they exist is not always clear, but the patterns are definitely there. Human beings seem to act in certain predictable ways. God, who never changes, always responds to man in certain predictable ways. There are patterns of history, patterns of behavior, and these patterns repeat and repeat and repeat. It just so happens, and maybe you haven't noticed it, but there is a pattern of pride. And that is the title of this sermon, The Pattern of Pride. Lucifer is the archetype. He is the original pattern. And it's a pattern that has been repeated and repeated and repeated. Now, I want you to turn back with me, first of all, to Ezekiel, the 28th chapter. It's a reasonably familiar scripture, but I want to show you some things about it you may not understand. Ezekiel, the 28th chapter, is not primarily about the devil. It is not even primarily about rebellion believe it or not. The chapter is about an individual, a man, called the Prince of Tyre. He was a human being. He was born of woman. He lived out his life. He ruled over real people in real time and real space. He was real. But this man so perfectly fit the pattern that he is placed in the book of Ezekiel, in prophecy, as a pattern of that original rebellion. And consequently, Ezekiel, in explaining this, under the power of the Holy Spirit, actually gives us an insight, quite deliberately, into the original archetype of pride. Chapter 28 begins, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus saith the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up, and because you say, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man, and not God, although you set your heart as the heart of God. Now, 
if you're familiar with ancient history, if you're familiar with ancient religion and with the custom of ancient kings to put themselves in position as God kings and to take to themselves all the prerogatives virtually of God, of life, of death on, upon their subjects, you will understand what it means for a king to declare just straightforwardly, I am God. I sit in the seat of God. As far as you are concerned, I am God. I can snuff your life out like I can blow out this candle. It was very true. He goes on to say, though, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from you. With your wisdom and with your understanding, you have gotten riches and gotten gold and silver into your treasuries. You know, there's a funny thing that, that a part of the pattern of pride seems to involve one or more of a number of different ingredients. Some of them are wisdom. Some of them are knowledge. Some have to do with understanding. They have to do with a, a concept or a self-concept of superior wisdom, superior knowledge, superior understanding to other people that might lead a person to do certain things. Included in the pattern oftentimes is a self-concept of superior beauty, of superior power, of the ability to do things that ordinary men can't do. He says, look at all these things that you have accomplished by your wisdom and by your traffic. You have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. In other words, and it isn't just the question of money because money represents power. And it was the accumulation of power, not just the riches or the wealth themselves, that had caused this individual, this man, to be so lifted up and to, to, in his own eyes that he stank in the nostrils of God. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of God, because you've exalted yourself in this way, behold, therefore, I'm going to bring strangers upon you, the terrible of the nations. They'll draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom. They shall defile your brightness. They shall bring you down to the pit, and you shall die in the depths of them that are, uh, I'm sorry, shall die the depths of them that are enslaved in the midst of the sea. Will you yet say before him that kills you, I am a god? Or are you going to still stand up and say, Ha, see, I am a god? As the man thrust a sword into your body? But you shall be a man and no god in the hand of him that kills you. You shall die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it. Now, this interesting thing happens here. At this point, he says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre. Well, he's just been going through all of this. What is this now that we are doing? Notice how the wording and the spirit of this thing changes. The pattern is precisely the same. But is he talking about the same individual Precisely, say unto this man, thus saith the Lord God, you seal up the sun, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. The king of Tyre had not been in the, in the garden of God, but I'll tell you what was there. The pattern was there. That particular pattern of behavior that spirit, that attitude was there. It was there in Satan the devil. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, gold. The workmanship of all your tabrets and your pipes, musical instruments, were prepared in you in the day that you were created. And the king of Tyre was born. But God said he created something here, a pattern of wisdom, of beauty, of knowledge, of performance. You are the anointed cherub that covers. You see, in the Bible, the prophets tend to slip from one pattern to another without necessarily telling you where they are and where they have gone. The Greek word for it is type. They spoke in terms of type and anti-type, and basically it means model or image. In other words, an image or a pattern is created. And then we have an anti-type or anti-pattern or a later pattern, a repeated pattern of this same thing. Now, the actual uh, fabric of which it is made may be different, but the pattern is the same. The color may vary, but the pattern is the same. There may be all sorts of variations that are introduced into it, but the fundamental pattern is all the same. 
And the pattern here is a pattern of pride. Pride is the, is the basic outline of all that is taking place here. And the things that come of it are the fruits of pride. Not of anything else, not of some other sin, but of this most fundamental of sins. This most spiritual of the sins that we commit. He continues to speak of him. You are the anointed cherub that covers, and I have set you so. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. By the multitude of your merchandise they have filled the midst of you with violence, and you have sinned. Therefore I will cast you as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. He's basically saying that the, the description of stones of fire is this factor that this cherub was actually in the presence of God. The expression, the anointed cherub that covers, refers to one of those two archangels which are pictured in the, in, in the original, uh, in Moses' time, in the uh, original statuary that was a part of the Ark of the Covenant. On, on the top of it, there were two images of cherubs with their wings stretching forward, covering the mercy seat, and the mercy seat was a symbol of the throne of God. Lucifer was one of those angels that actually was present at the throne of God, whose wings extended forth and covered the throne of God. He was that close, that close to the source of every power in the universe. And he himself shared enormously in that power. But he said, I'm going to destroy you. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. I will cast you to the ground. I will lay you before kings that they may behold you. And inevitably, pride leads to the corruption of wisdom, to the corruption of understanding, to the corruption of knowledge, and ultimately also to the corruption of beauty. Satan, we are told, or Lucifer, we are told, and, and Isaiah emphasizes this in much the same way that Ezekiel does. He does it in his 14th chapter. Tells us that there was a rebellion that grew. It was the fruit of pride, of the pattern of pride. So as I said earlier, there are some specific elements in all of this. And the pattern repeats itself for a reason. If you'll turn back to Ephesians, the second chapter, there's an interesting little statement made almost in passing, but of really tremendous significance. Ephesians, the second chapter, in verse 1. You has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. His subject is not pride or the devil or anything of the sort. His subject is the fact that you who were dead in trespasses and sins have been made alive. But in passing, he makes a point. You were dead in trespasses and sin, whereas in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. The wording of this is fascinating in many ways, and I'm not one to want to be, get involved in a strife of words or to put too much of an argument on words or to lean on it too heavily. But there are some things here, I think, that are important to understand. One is the word works. There is a spirit that exists that works. It does not merely exist. It is not merely present. It is not merely just here and there and wandering to and fro, perhaps existing in the world, and you and I happen to come into contact with it. It actually works. Works means what? You're moving things, changing things, manipulating things, pushing, pulling, tugging, yanking, jerking, persuading. Works. That's an important thing for us to understand. There is a spirit that works in the children of disobedience. And that spirit works in the same pattern it has always worked in. It can no more depart from that pattern than a leopard can change or can get rid of its spots or an Ethiopian can get rid of his skin. It is the pattern of Satan the devil himself. He is at work, and he works according to that pattern, and he works in more than one person. He works in the children plural, of disobedience. 
I don't know if you've thought about this very much, but as you live your life, you are continually coming into contact with this pattern, with this pattern of behavior, with, the, with this spirit that is at work in the children of disobedience in this world. And I think it's important for us to understand that this pattern will bear fruit. And it's recognizable by its fruit. Oh, it bears all sorts of fruit. I couldn't possibly begin to categorize or to list them all for you. It's easy to see how hypocrisy is a fruit of it, isn't it? A fruit of pride. It's easy to see how wrath is a fruit of it. Whereas Satan began to feel that he was being held down by God. He began to feel that he was as good as God. And he began to resent God. Anger became a part of it. And so anger as a fruit of this pattern is as natural as day following night. It is as natural as sunrise every morning. Stubbornness is one of the fruits of this pattern. Self-exaltation is a fruit of pride. For indeed, I deserve better than what I have gotten. And I'm going to reach out. And I'm going to try to take it. And the fruits of pride are very evident. And I want to illustrate for you, if I can, what I mean by this. And to demonstrate for you a classic illustration of what I mean by patterns. I want you to turn back to Numbers, the 16th chapter. Numbers, the 16th chapter, is a description of the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. These men who after quite a long period of time got involved in a palace coup, as it were, against Moses. Now, these, this scripture I have heard preached on so many times over so many years. And generally speaking, the purpose of, the, of, of a sermon on this has been to kind of uh, intimidate people who were in an attitude of rebellion. And the whole subject of a sermon in which this is normally brought out is rebellion. Uh, and it's a, uh, used for the purpose, I think, in many cases of trying to control people. It, many, many of us in this particular audience, or who will hear these sermons later, or this tape later, may well be hypersensitized to this particular passage of Scripture because of the way it has been abused in the past. But I'm not here for that purpose today. What I want you to see in this chapter is something you may not have seen before. It is a almost letter-perfect repetition of a classic pattern of human behavior and divine response. The pattern of pride and the fruit of pride, as it actually fell out in a very real confrontation. Now, we have two men. One is named Moses, and the other is named Aaron. From what you know of the Bible story and Bible history, would you say that Moses and Aaron bore some sort of credentials? Yeah. Would you say that they had some element of credibility? Why, certainly. I mean, after all, uh, now, of course, anyone can claim that God has sent him, couldn't he? But after all, Moses not only made that claim, but it was backed up by the plagues in Egypt. Uh, it was backed up by miracles being performed. It was backed up by the fact that they were not in Egypt anymore. They were out of there. It was backed up by the fact that they had actually walked dry shod across the bottom of the Red Sea while Moses stood holding his hands up. You know, they knew. They'd seen. They had lived. So Moses in their eyes, had to have had some degree of credential in their side. But let's read and see what is taking place here. Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, he was a Levite, Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the, of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. Now, I want you to understand something. This is not merely a criticism of an existing administration. This is not merely the New York Times writing an editorial critical of the president's policy uh, on the Contras in Central America. This is not just criticism. This is an organized movement on their part. We have several people who are involved in it, and an enormous amount of work has been done leading up to this confrontation. How do I know that? Well, how did they get these 200 men? How did they have them all lined up? How had they achieved their agreement with what they were about to do? How had they got them to where they would stand with them? There had been hours and hours and hours of work around campfires preparing for this moment in time. These men have developed 
a political power block to force change upon the congregation of Israel. Isn't that what's happening? Isn't it relatively simple to see? Do you realize that that's precisely what Satan was attempting to do when he rebelled against God? We have to read carefully through a number of scriptures to put the whole picture together. But we learn from Revelation that his, his tail drew, the old dragon, who is Satan, his tail drew one-third of the stars of heaven. Stars are identified as angels. The implication is that one-third of all the created angels of God followed him in what he was doing. He had organized an enormous power block to attempt to force change. It is exactly the same pattern. Mind you, as I said, it's not merely a pattern of criticism, of constructive criticism, or making recommendations how things ought to be done differently. Jethro did that. Moses walked up to, to Jethro walked up to Moses and says, "What are you doing? You're trying to kill yourself. You're going to wear yourself out. This is stupid. What you're doing here? You're going. To, you're sitting up here from early in the morning until late at night. You don't even have time to eat properly. You're not getting any exercise. You're killing yourself judging these people." Now, what you ought to do is you ought to appoint captains of 50 and captains of 100 and captains of 1,000. And you ought to have the people go to them first and let them handle the small matters. Then you can handle the big matters. You need to reorganize this thing. Moses looked him in the eye and said, you're right. Did it. Constructive criticism, one-on-one, -on -one, accomplished change. But you see, what apparently what Korah and Dathan and Abiram wanted to do was a little more than just force some kind of administrative policy change. They wanted to have a role of their own in whatever was going on. And in fact, every indication is that in the end result, they wanted to replace Moses and Aaron, just as Satan wanted to replace God. Just as the king of Tyre set himself up as God, sitting in the seat of God, and just as one more individual in the end of time is going to place himself in the seat of God and proclaim that he is God, it is precisely the same pattern all over again. And I should tell you that these patterns repeat in various sizes. All of you ladies know that you can have the same pattern for a dress, and you can make it in all kinds of different sizes, can't you? The same pattern, the same outlines, the same general shape and design, but it can come in a wide variety of sizes. The patterns of human behavior exist at the cosmic level, at the spiritual level, at governmental level, at personal level, at church level, at local church level, and even all the way down to small committees, and they make their way even into the home. And the same old pattern just repeats and repeats and repeats. They gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you lift yourselves up above the congregation of the Lord? Now here is an element that is not that evident, in a sense, in the previous pattern. It has not, you know, just happened quite this way when Satan rebelled against God. It didn't happen quite this way in the pattern with the king of Tyre. But what is rather interesting here, that what they do is directly challenge the credentials of these two men. They say to them, why are you taking upon yourself this responsibility and this authority? Your credentials are not valid. We are as good as you are. We know all of this stuff just like you are. God is capable of speaking to me just like he is capable of speaking to you. There is no difference between us. Is this not a challenge of their credentials? It is a rejection of their leadership. It is essentially saying, we're not accepting the fact that God sent you. You are making claims that we are not willing to acknowledge. And when Moses heard it, he fell on his face just fell on his face. I think Moses, at this point in time, halfway expected a great scythe from God to come sweeping through them like, a, like it would cut wheat and chop off the heads of a bunch of people. You know, he wanted on the ground. He was totally abject in his fear of God 
and of what God's response might be to this kind of behavior. And he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow uh, the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. And I'm, I'm reminded of Paul's statement later on, which he will make. It falls out of the same pattern. He said, Now let's all understand, brethren, there have to be heresies among us. It's inevitable. They will come. It must take place. And there's a reason, he says, it is because it is so that they who are approved of God may be made manifest. Oftentimes the only way you can tell is by the fact that the heresies come along, and then you can see what God does, and you can see how things fall out, and you can see who God's with and who God's not with. Sometimes it's not apparent immediately. Sometimes you have to kind of wait and watch a little bit to see what's going on. He said, tomorrow God will show who are his. God will show who is holy. He will cause him to come near unto him whom he will. This do. You take censers, Korah, and all his company, and you put fire in them and incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord does choose, he shall be holy. You take too much upon you, you sons of Levi. Now Levi also was credentialed. You know, Levi, the whole tribe of Levi was selected by God. They were given all of the tithes in Israel as their inheritance for their service, which they were going to serve in the tabernacle and the congregation. They held office. They were responsible men. They had a job to do, and they were honored by God for that job. But for these particular individuals, not for all of Levi, but just for these, it was not enough. He says, does it seem a small thing to you, verse 9, that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle and to stand before the congregation to minister to them? And he has brought you near to him and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you. And are you going to seek the priesthood also? Now, we have no priesthood in the church, so the pattern wouldn't fit us perfectly, would it? But what happened here is what we're looking at. What, the, the pattern that, that, the, of Satan, who was the anointed cherub that covered, who was one of the angels of God, and not just any angel, but one of the archangels, and it was not enough. He had to be more. He had to seek God's office himself. For which cause, he says... Both you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron? You know, what, who's he? You're murmuring against Aaron? What, what in the world is Aaron that you should get excited about him? You remember what C.S. Lewis made the comment? He said, it's not merely enmity against man. It is enmity against God. Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab. They were not Levites. And they said, let's see, I may have them confused here, but a couple of them were not. He sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and they said, we will not come up. You know, he, I don't know what he wanted to do. I guess he wanted to talk to them, wanted to reason with them, try to persuade them. And they absolutely refused to come up and talk to him. They said, is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land that flows with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, except that you make yourself altogether a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land that flows with milk and honey. You are failing. You were not doing what you said you would do. You're not following through with it. And in fact, he hadn't got them there yet. Oh, they didn't quite own up to their own problems and why they had not gotten into a milk and honey. They weren't quite willing to deal with their own culpability, and their own unwillingness to fight some of the battles they had to fight. They said, here we are out here in the, in the, in, you know, eating in, uh, in the wilderness and being hungry. You haven't done what you said you would do. What are you going to do? Put out the eyes of these men? We're not coming up. They actually claimed that they would be mistreated if they would, were to come up where Moses was. And Moses was angry, and he said to the Lord, Don't respect their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, and I haven't hurt any of them. And Moses said to Korah, You and all your company be before the Lord, you and they and Aaron tomorrow. Take every man his censer, put incense in them, and bring you before the Lord every man his censer, 250 censers. You also and Aaron, bring every one of you his censer. So they did. They all took censers, which was a thing that they burned incense in, and they put fire in there, and they laid incense on them, and they stood in the door of the, of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them. I mean, there were nearly everybody was there. Opposite, against Moses and Aaron in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. It was an organized thing, an organized, raw power play. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. 
They all came around, and all of a sudden there was a shimmering light around that tabernacle, and I suppose it must have gotten everybody's attention. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, to two men, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Do you realize, you know, God doesn't bluff. That God was, what he was telling Moses and Aaron to do at this moment of time was to get up and walk out of this camp so that they would be the only two people left alive. He was going to destroy all of them. They fell on their faces and said, O God, this God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and will you be wroth with the whole congregation? One man. Oddly enough, except for the fact that Korah is named first, we don't really know much about these men. We don't really know what has gone on. But it's very evident that the pride, apparently, of one man, or at the most four, or three, had infected and caused and brought all these people to this place. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying... Notice God didn't speak to them. He told Moses to tell them. He said, Get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Get away from them. Don't be anywhere near them. And Moses rose up and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed them. He spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and don't touch anything of theirs, lest you be consumed in their sins. So they got up from the temp tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. The people got up and moved. Now they had been brought there against Moses, and they had murmured against Moses before. But it's kind of tough, isn't it, when you, you would think that whenever the, ta the, the, the glory of God was actually appearing to the whole congregation, here we are all gathered around, all of us in a rotten attitude, in a rotten spirit, in a rotten frame of mind, a rebellious spirit against, against the man that's led us out of Egypt, a man whom we know God has used before. Now all of a sudden lightning starts flashing behind him, in and around the tabernacle. Boy, I tell you, it would take a lot of gall not to move away. And they did. Got up and backed off. And, Cor and they said they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives, and their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works. For I have not done them of my own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open up her mouth and swallow them up with all that pertains to them, and they go down quick to the pit, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. They didn't provoke Moses. You know, Moses, no doubt, was somewhat provoked. But the fact is, it wasn't Moses that they were the in, had, had, had declared themselves enemies of. It was God. And it came to pass, as he made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground split asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses, and the men that appertained to Korah and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled. They ran at the cry of them. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed 250 men that were standing there with censers in their hands, offering incense. Burned them to a crisp where they stood on their feet. These were the 250 men that had been recruited into this cabal, this, this rebellion that they were involved in. Sobering thought, isn't it? These all are the fruits of pride. All of it is the fruits. You can reach up and pluck off the tree. And the last one to be plucked off the tree was death. It was sobering to contemplate what all that meant and where all that led and how that pattern repeated. But the pattern of pride includes party spirit. It includes power politics. In other words, if we can get other leaders behind us, we can force this thing through. You know, this generally is what you have to do if you have an idea that's not good enough to make it on its own. Generally speaking, when people have to try to force things by power of politics, it's because they're trying to put across an idea whose time has not yet come. And indeed, whose time may never come. The pattern of pride involves the rejection of legitimate leadership. 
of existing leadership that is legitimate, that is credential, that actually may not have paper credentials, but has the credentials of God upon them. You know, I think, as I've already pointed out, it's important also not to confuse constructive criticism with this. Another fruit of it is defiance. You're not going to tell me what to do. I will not come up. And the imputation of evil and foul motives to that legitimate leadership, which was done in this case, as they said, if we, what do you want us to come up for? You want to put these men's eyes out? Is that what you're trying to get us up there for? And, of course, the final fruit, as I've already pointed out, death. Now, there are other interesting places in the Bible where you can look at this pattern and kind of get an eye of it. Proverbs, the sixth chapter, is, is one of the places. The pattern and its fruits are talked about repeatedly all the way through your Bible. Proverbs 6 and verse 16. These things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. Number one, a proud look. Heads the list right up at the top. He goes on to talk about all the other things that a man might do. But at the beginning of the list, a proud look. Proverbs 8, in verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride, arrogancy, and the evil way, and the perverse mouth do I hate. You ever considered, you know, every one of us has pride in some measure. And it's hard, you know, when you stop and pause and look at this and say, wait a minute, God absolutely loathes this spirit, this attitude, this pattern of behavior, this spirit that works in us to create the pattern of pride in our lives. Proverbs 13 is a very profound statement, one that you need to mark in your Bible and perhaps memorize. Proverbs 13 and verse 10. Only... By pride comes contention, but with those who take advice is wisdom. Revised Standard Version of the last part of that. Only by pride comes contention. Now, you want to think that through. That's a profound statement. It's, a, it's rather extreme. It basically tells you that all you have to do is look around and find contention. Just see if you can put your finger on some strife. Some argument, some bickering, some, some contention. And he is telling you here, there is only one source for it. It comes from only one thing. Not from this among others, but only by this. Only by pride comes contention. Now, what are we to think of this when we find ourselves involved in a strife or a fight? Is it always the other person's fault? Is it always uh, you know, pointing the finger at someone else and saying, well, see, he's a proud person, that's why we're having this problem that we're having? I don't know. can't give you all the answers, but I can sure tell you this much. Wherever strife is, wherever contention is, it is coming through pride. In the 16th chapter, verse 5, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord, though hand join in hand. He cannot go unpunished. Shall I repeat it? Everyone, not most, everyone who is proud in heart, and he doesn't even discuss the degrees of pride, is abomination to the Lord. He hates it, loathes it, can't stand it. And this says he can't stand the person. We're fond of saying that God loves the sinner and hates the sin, but here we are down to a sin that so permeates people that it would lead God to say that he hates the person. The person becomes abomination to God, who is proud at heart. And he said, and I don't care what method you devise. I don't care how many people you put around them. I don't care if you have 200 men with censers or 250. I don't care if you have an army with shields and spears. They will not go unpunished. Now, if you feel the cold fingers of fear gripping you every once in a while as you think of some of these things, it is good. It's a healthy sign. It's a sign that you have not become so hardened through whatever small degree of pride you may have that you cannot be touched by the Spirit of God when you start thinking about the possibility of being looked upon as an abomination in the eyes of God and that there is punishment. I mean, very specific punishment that God has in mind for people. And he will not allow any methodology or any event or any circumstance to allow a person whose heart is filled with pride to escape what he has in store for them. 
verse 18. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with a lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Well, that's easy to see when you read what we just read in the first part of that chapter. Back in chapter 28, the final proverb. Proverbs chapter 28. In verse 25, He that is of a proud heart stirs up strife, but he that puts his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. You know, there are two little things you are told in the book of Proverbs. One of them is that anywhere you find strife or contention, pride is the cause. And then another thing you are told is that whenever you have a person where pride has become a problem, where the pattern of pride is present, he will, I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts, he will stir up strife. So the connection is made, isn't it? It's absolutely inexorable, it is unavoidable, it is, the finger is pointed, and it's not my finger, it is the finger of God that has pointed out this particular cause, this particular problem. Now, this has all been Old Testament up to this point, point. I want you to turn back with me to Matthew, because Jesus also described this same pattern. And he describes it in slightly different terms, but all of it is still there, and all of the same things happen, and the same fruits are born. In the 23rd chapter of Matthew, he says of the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat, and he says, I want you to do after their words, but don't do what they do. You're going to be in a lot of trouble. They say, and they don't do. They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne. They lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. All their works they do to be seen of men. Pride. They make broad their phylacteries. They enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the uppermost rooms at the seats, at the feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues. All those symbols of power are grasped at by these people. Satan was grasping at the symbols of power as well. Korah was grasping at the symbols of power. The king of Tyre was grasping at the, at the, at the throne of power and claiming himself to be God. And the pattern goes on and finds in this little little small cadre of Pharisees at Jerusalem one more repetition of an age-old pattern, the grasping for the symbols and the seats of power. They love greetings in the market, to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. They want all the accoutrements of power, and, of course, are very jealous of those who have them when they do not. Be you not called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all you are brethren. And call no man your father upon earth. And so on he develops all of the things that he's saying. He said, don't be called master, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. This is a fruit of the pattern of pride. One of the things you will always pluck from that tree, ultimately, is abasement. Whereas the person humbles himself, he goes on to say, will be exalted. Paul also encountered this, this pattern himself. And it's rather interesting. I won't take the time to read Scripture upon Scripture to prove to you what I'm talking about. But when the Apostle Paul came into a city and began to preach to people in this city, he brought with him no credentials. You know, he, he didn't have a piece of paper. And there was nothing particularly prepossessing about this man. He was not impressive to look at. Indications are that he was balding, that he did not have very good eyesight and tended to peer at people, that he was a short, bandy-legged Benjamite Jew. I mean, he wasn't a Jew. He was a Benjamite, but he was categorized by many people as a Jew. But there was something about this man. Because wherever he went and wherever he preached, churches were raised up. Now, you and I, we would agree, would we not, that Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, had credentials? Of course. I mean, how could we, how could we who have sat at his feet and studied his epistles and learned from him again and again and again, how could we deny this man who he is and what he is and, and what his credentials are? Well, you see, though, wherever Paul went, it seems, the legitimacy of his leadership was questioned. His credentials were questioned. People wanted to say, well, you know, uh, who made you an apostle? How do we know that you are what you say you are? His credentials were, were questioned. 
His leadership was questioned. His authority was questioned. His administration was questioned. Oh, sure it was. They questioned the way he used the money. There was no church where Paul was more at pains to avoid criticism in matters of money than Corinth. And there was no church that criticized him more severely in matters of money administration than Corinth. So you can see how much good his care actually did him. He makes a statement, he makes a number of statements actually to these people, which reveal to us what was going on. We need to read these statements today and think about them, not so much just for what Paul was saying about himself, but for what it tells us about the pattern that existed in the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church now, we have to understand, where Paul went and had worked and had been there a long time, would not have even existed if it had not been for Paul. Right? The church, there would have been no Corinthian church. He was the one who went there. He was the one who risked his life. He was the one who labored and worked with his own hands and didn't take a dime from those people to preach and to preach and to preach. He had received no reward for it. He writes to them in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians, verse 1. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Aren't you my work in the Lord? Now, maybe I am not an apostle to others. If I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you. Because the very seal of my apostleship is you in the Lord. My answer to them that examine me is this. Do I not have the power to eat and drink? And basically he means at church expense. And he goes on in the rest of the chapter to discuss this whole question of whether it's right for him as a minister to receive somehow or other help from them. And yet he said, I never did it. He says, I received help. I robbed other churches, in fact, so that I might make my service to you of no charge. If I am not an apostle anywhere else, people, shouldn't I be an apostle to you? I mean, after all, uh, have you not learned from me, he said. You know, he could go down and talk about everything they knew about Jesus they had learned from him. He hadn't baptized very many of them. He delegated that job to other people. But he had preached the gospel. He had brought the gospel. He had, again, avoided trying to create a cult following for himself. He had done everything he knew how to try to see to it that these people looked to God. But now there was a pattern beginning to develop in this church. The old, old pattern of putting together various parties to bring about change or to bring about influence or to accomplish certain ends in this particular local congregation. And he threw up his hands. He didn't know what to say. He said, in one case, I, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed labor in vain to one church. He said, I, he see this. This was not only in Corinth. It happened in Galatia. It happened here and there. He was criticized by the Thessalonians. He was very gentle with them, for they had undergone much. Paul was not quite so gentle with the Corinthians. If you'll turn back with me to chapter 4, I'd like to just you know, go through this little segment of his response to these people. As, their, you know, as a result of their attitude and of the pattern that had begun to develop in their attitude, their behavior, and their questioning. Chapter 4, 1 Corinthians. How are you people supposed to look at me? Let a man so account of us as the ministers or servants of Christ, as stewards of the mystery of God. Now, I could, I, I could cheerfully say the same thing to you. How are you supposed to look at me? I want you to look upon me as a servant of Christ. You know, I'm not a, a lord and master of this congregation or any other. I am not a lord and master of a church. I am a servant of of Jesus Christ. Now that in itself has uh, some rather profound implications. But I want you to understand, minister of Christ, a servant. And as a steward of the mysteries of God. These, now a steward is a person who takes charge of and handles things that don't belong to him, that belong to someone else. Okay, We are stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. We understand that. I certainly know that God is going to hold me accountable for what I preach. But with me, Paul is speaking, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or of man's judgment. In fact, I do not even judge myself. 
You see, there were people in this congregation who had said, Paul takes too much upon himself. For all the congregation are holy. Just like Korah had come up to Moses and said, you and Aaron take too much upon yourself. The people, there were people in Corinth who had rejected Paul's leadership, who had rejected his authority, and then just questioned it. They had rejected it. They were no longer saying to themselves, this man does speak for God. He is not. And they're no longer saying he is a minister of Christ. Not of me. Not of you. But of Christ. And he is accountable, not to me, not to you, but to Christ. Now they were trying to find some other way, I guess, of holding Paul accountable. And he said, it's a small thing that I should be judged by you. Or of any man's judgment. I don't judge myself. I don't know anything against myself. I, don't, I think Paul could have found some things if he'd wanted to, but he, he meant basically regarding things regarding his stewardship and his ministry. And yet, I am not justified. In other words, the mere fact that I don't know anything against myself doesn't mean that there's not something there. But he that judges me is the Lord. Therefore, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, To all of you I say, judge nothing before the time. You suppose anybody in Corinth was judging? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you see, all of a sudden we find another element that was there all along. We just didn't quite name it in all this pattern of pride. It is judging. For you see, any time you sit and judge another person, you either approve or condemn his conduct, you are actually putting yourself in the position, in a position above that person as one who is able to criticize, one who is able to condemn, one whose opinion of him matters somehow. And Paul says, don't you get involved in judging things before the time. When's the time? Well, he says, until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes that you might learn in us not to think of men above what is written that none of you be puffed up for one against another who makes you different from another what is the you know who's actually made one of you better than anybody else isn't it God what do you have that you do not receive I mean, hasn't everything you have about God and about God's word and about his not hasn't it been given to you well, then why is it you boast as though somebody didn't give it to you? As though you somehow had gotten it on your own. Now you are full. Now you are rich. You have reigned as kings without us. You people have really gotten big. I wish that you did reign, that we might reign with you. For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last. As it were, appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle in the world, and to angels and to men. We are fools. For Christ's sake, ah, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak. Ah, but you are strong. You know, I don't know how to administer funds in a church, but I'm sure all of you really know how that ought to be done. I don't know how to manage things. I don't know how to, to do my job. But, oh, I'm sure all of you people really do know exactly how it ought to be done. We are weak. Ah, but you are strong. You are honorable. Ah, we are not. Even to this present hour, we both hunger and are thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And we labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defrauded, defamed, we entreat. Notice, these, look what happened to him. You know, and do you realize that some of these things happened to him at the hands of the church? The brethren some of the defamation that was given to him. We are made as the filth and the offscouring of the world of all things to this day. I don't write these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be you followers of me. Imitators, do these things. You know, that's, that is really some of the heaviest statement that you will ever read from a minister of Jesus Christ to a people who have allowed themselves to fall into the pattern of pride. 
and to set themselves up as judges of him and his work and of what he had done. It happened to Paul. It happened to Moses and to Aaron. And in fact, it also happened to Jesus. For the scribes and the Pharisees continually had to say, well, who does he think he is? Where does he get this authority? By what authority does he say all these things? Paul addresses this a little further in 2 Corinthians, and I'd like for you to turn back there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some who think of us as though we walked after the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. He then continues to criticize on many of the things that they have done. He says, though for in verse, verse 8, he says, Though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord has given us for edification, not for your destruction. I wouldn't be ashamed to do that. I, I could easily go on and talk some more about my authority, he said. But I'm not going to do that. I don't want to seem to terrify you by letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful. But his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is contemptible. Let such a one think this, that such... As we are in word, by letters when we are absent, such will we be indeed when we are present. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. You know, that set themselves up, pat themselves on the back, claim things for themselves like Korah and Dathan did. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. And there just isn't any point and getting involved in this thing of measuring one another and, and comparing ourselves with one another, he said it's an utterly pointless thing. He says in verse 18, the reason why, for not, for not he that commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. And earlier he had asked this same church, he says, how do you want me to come to you when I come to you? With a rod? Or, you know, in mercy and in compassion? You know, it was that scripture in these passages in Corinthians that made me realize that the old idea I had when, before I ever came to God's church of local church autonomy had, had some very weak, very bad holes in it. Because that, the church in Corinth, obviously, did not consider themselves, nor did Paul consider themselves, an autonomous church. They were not able just to simply rise up and say, we don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. Because he said, what do you want me to do? Come in there with a rod to chastise or in a spirit of meekness? There's one thing I want to point out before I get away from it. There is a difference between pride and self-esteem. There has much been said in recent years about self-esteem. And the fact is it is important for a person to realize his value. That each and every one of us has a value. And we are of enormous and great precious value in the sight of God. But you see, self-esteem has to do with valuing yourself for what you are. Pride has to do with valuing yourself in relation to others, comparing yourself among yourselves, and measuring yourselves by yourselves is where the big difference between the two of them comes in. Pride is essentially competitive. Pride is enmity. One of the most disturbing things about the pattern of pride is that one of the fruits of this pattern is the loss of salvation. Do you remember when we came down to the end of the story about Dathan and uh, Korah, Dathan and Abiram, that they earth opened up and swallowed them up, that 250 men standing there with censers in their hand were consumed by fire where they stood on their feet? That was death. But it seems there is a more serious thing involved in this, and I want you to think about it. Pride is the absolute antithesis of repentance. It is absolutely impossible to come to a true repentance before God and retain any vestiges of pride at all. Pride and repentance are opposites. 
We understand that. How can you repent until you're willing to give up that pride? And you know, it explains in some measure why the unpardonable sin is unpardonable. And one of the key elements in the unpardonable sin is pride. An unwillingness to admit wrong. An unwillingness to repent. And Satan got to the place where his pride was so strong and was so rotten that he was no longer able to repent. We're told in God's Word that that sort of thing can also happen to people. You know, when I give a sermon like this, I often despair of results. Because the truth is that most of the people most in need of this sermon uh, will not even understand it at all. It won't really say anything to them at all. They will not be touched by it at all. In fact, if they are touched by it at all, they may very well become angry at what they hear. For pride is very quick to resent. Some of Jesus' disciples came to him one day and said, Lord, are there few that be saved? They were very concerned about it. You know, they listened to his sermons again and again and again. They had this growing conviction. When they saw what he was demanding and they saw what kind of standards he was requiring, and when they looked inside themselves and they looked at people that they knew, they said, Lord, is, is, are there few people that are going to be saved? He said, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many are going to seek to enter in and just will not be able. It will be impossible. They'll just not be able to do it. He continued to explain all this thing to them. And in another place, as they asked him about this, or in actually in the Sermon on the Mount, he developed the thought a little further. He said, the time is going to come when the Son of Man comes into the kingdom, and there are going to be those people thrust out of it. And they're going to come to him, and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, open to us. He said, we have eaten, and we have drunk in your presence. And others are going to say, Lord, we have done many mighty works in your name. We have even cast out devils in your name. Let us in. Do you realize what those people are saying? You know what Jesus' response was. Get away. I don't know you. Do you realize what they were saying? They were saying, we deserve to be in there. Look at what we have done. We've eaten and drunk in your presence. We've done all these things. We've even done miracles and mighty works. We've obeyed the law. We have cast out demons in your name. We deserve it. And you know, it's the ultimate fruit of pride. Of coming to the place to where you believe that you deserve the reward that God might have in store for you. That you believe you deserve for God to do good things to you. That you believe you deserve all sorts of wonderful blessings to be falling down about your head. And one of the reasons why people who, when they encounter adversity, come to hate God is because they believe they deserve better. I will not judge whether they do or not, but I will simply say that the person who has to undergo trial and has to undergo tribulation and has to experience fear and anxiety, who is able to look upon these things as a part of the cross that God has called upon him to bear, will never become resentful of God. But the person who has pride, who believes he deserves better, may come to even hate God because of what they perceive that God has done to them. You know, I've had people occasionally on a sermon like this say, were you speaking to me in that sermon? I'll give you a piece of advice. Don't ever ask if a sermon was directed at you. If you have to ask, the only answer I can give you is no, the sermon was not for you. doesn't have much application for you. Because you see, this sermon that I'm giving today is not for the proud. It's not for the proud, for I expect the people who are eaten up with pride to do absolutely nothing about this sermon. The only way a person who is eaten up with pride will ever be reached is if God breaks his legs, if God smites him down where he stands, if God perhaps even takes his life and brings him up again to resurrection to get his attention. Whatever must be done, only God can accomplish that. There was a time in my life many, many years ago when I felt an obligation, if I was working with someone trying to train them for the ministry, to humble that person. I learned a lot better than that. Humbling a human being 
is a prerogative of God, not of man. And no man should ever do it. This sermon is not for the proud. <clears throat> it is for those to whom it is given by God to understand and respond. Now let's go back in conclusion. And let me read what C.S. Lewis said one more time and see if you think he was right. According to Christian leaders, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride, unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads us to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. It is pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. Other vices may sometimes bring people together. You may find good fellowship and jokes and friendliness among drunken people or even among unchaste people. But pride always means enmity. It is enmity. And not only enmity between man and man, but enmity to God. It is a terrible thing that the worst of all the vices can smuggle itself into the very center of our religious life. But you can see why. The other and less bad vices come from the devil working on us through our animal nature. But this does not come through our animal nature at all. Pride does not. It comes direct from hell. It is purely spiritual. Consequently, it is far more subtle, far more deadly. For pride is spiritual cancer. It eats up the very possibility of love or contentment or even common sense.